everyone to open up tonight to Proverbs as we continue on Proverbs chapter 10. And we come to one verse tonight, and it's the only verse in Proverbs that addresses this subject. Proverbs chapter 10. <coughs> and notice what it says in Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 16. The Bible says, The wage of the righteous leads to life, the gain of the wicked to sin. In other words, when a righteous person makes money, the way they spend it leads to life. When a wicked person makes money, the way they spend it leads to sin. So I'd like to title the message of this proverb tonight, How You Spend Your Money indicates the true nature of your heart. Isn't it interesting, guys? We just got done looking at a lot of verses in Proverbs 10 that told you how you speak indicates the nature of your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now we come to a verse tonight that tells us that not only out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, but also out of the abundance of the heart, the, the person spends How you spend your money indicates the true nature of your heart. You know, if you really want to see the true nature of a person's heart, what means to most to them, what they desire the most, watch how they spend their money. I thought about this too. You know, if you really want to see the true nature of a person's heart, give them extra money. What do they do with it? Have you ever thought about the two? You ever, you ever notice too? If you want to see the true nature of your own heart, give you some extra time. All of a sudden, you walk in and you've got free time on your hands. What do you tend to do with it? What would you tend to do if all of a sudden you walked into a boatload of money? You now had a bunch of money to spend you didn't have before. The Bible says, when a righteous person earns an income. He uses that money towards life. When a wicked person gets his income, he uses that money towards death. You guys ever notice how many people, I remember, I remember when, I, when I was in college, and one of the toughest jobs I had my sophomore year of college, I came home in the summertime, and I worked at this factory on Elmwood Avenue called George H. Dean Steel. Still there. And you know what I used to do, and I, of course I, I, I didn't know how to do it. They taught me how to do this. But I used to, all day long, they had these steel beams come through, and someone else in the plant had marked where they were supposed to drill holes into them. And I had this drill, and all day long I would drill holes in steel beams all day. And I would listen to these guys. These guys had been there all, you know, working at the factory for 30 years, 35 years. You know what they couldn't wait? Give me the paycheck on Friday, baby. And where are those guys all going to be on Friday night? They're going to be in the bar. They're going to be in it. You know what he did? You give that guy a little bit of money. What's he going to do? It's going to lead to sin. How you spend your money indicates the true nature of your heart. You see somebody, you give them all of a sudden an extra, extra bit of money they didn't have. Watch how they spend it. The Bible says you will see the condition of their heart. Watch how they spend their money. You see a person who loves pleasure more than God. The guy gets a little bit of money, and he's going to be down here in the plaza trying to buy something off somebody. Why? Because he loves pleasure more than he loves God. You give him a little bit extra money, it's going to lead to sin. You guys ever heard the news sometimes? Some of these famous athletes, they get all kinds of money. And they're out there spending on prostitutes and all kinds of things. Now they got now they got some extra cash. The Bible says you watch it. Just like out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. Also out of the abundance of your, of your heart, your hand spins. 
The income of the righteous goes toward life. The income of the wicked goes toward sin. In other words, guys, a righteous person spends their money on righteous things. A wicked person spends their money on sinful things. That's what they do. And you and I can say all that we want to say. I can make all however I want to profess about myself. But watch what you do when you suddenly get a bunch of money you just not, did not have. Again, if I want to know the true nature of my own heart, watch what I do when I suddenly get a bunch of free time. What do I do? There are some people, the only thing that keeps them in line is because they got to go to work the next day, they got to do this, or, or maybe they are a spouse that's looking over their shoulder or, or whatever it may be. But all of a sudden, you give them the time when the spouse is not there or they got some time on their hands, what do they go to do? That tells you who they are. It tells you the true condition of their heart. That's what the Bible says. We have to ask ourselves the question, everybody. If you had the money or the time to do what you want, what would it be? That's a great test. That's a great way to really look at the nature of where, where is my heart? You know, one of the things that Jesus said about the Pharisees, you people honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. So I need to really, I need to listen to what God is saying here and ask myself, what would I do if I walked into a bunch of money I did not previously have? Where would my heart go? If I could buy or had the freedom, what would I want to do? You know, the Bible says in another proverb, as he thinks in his heart, so he is. And this is one thing that's awesome about the Lord. You know, when he deals with us, he really deals with us there. He deals with us at the desire, at the will. By the way, when a person's born again, that's what he changes. You know, your flesh is always going to be deceived. Your flesh is always going to be corrupted. Your flesh is... This will not change until you are glorified. Remember, when a person is saved, there are, there are something that happens. The moment they trust Jesus, they are justified. That is a positional thing. God declares you justified. And he declares you justified because the penalty has been paid. And who paid that penalty, Tasha? Jesus. That's right. So, so God says, you are justified. I declare you righteous because the Christ has done his job. The Christ succeeded. Is your faith in him? You're justified. That's your position. The moment a person repents and believes, they are justified. Then there's a second part of your salvation. It's called being sanctified. That is the process. That's not a point in time. That is a process by which God makes you in reality what you are in position. In position, you are now righteous. You are now his child. Sanctification is the process by which he makes your life look like what you are. Okay? So you are now his child. You're now his daughter. His daughter is a different person now. So sanctification is God's spirit within you. Remember we read tonight, Tasha, that the, he said, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who at work in the life of Christians to sanctify my desires, sanctify my will, so that I don't feel like I used to about... Now, now my flesh is still tempted. My flesh is always going to be weak. And it's going to be a battle. The Bible says the spirit is going to fight against the flesh, and the flesh is going to fight against the spirit. It's going to be a fight. And the Bible says for a Christian, you know how you'll be sanctified? When they're fighting, yield to the spirit. 
when both of them have their hands and you say, come with me, and they're both pulling opposite ways, the flesh is pulling you this way and the spirit's pulling you this way, the Bible says yield to the spirit. And what? And by the way, how do you know what way the spirit's pulling you? He's going to remind you of scripture. He's going to bring to your mind scriptures that you've learned, that you've memorized, that you've heard in sermons, songs that you've heard. All of a sudden, your flesh is going to be pulling you a certain way, and here comes a scripture verse in your mind. Here comes a song you sing at church. Who's that coming from? That's God's spirit. He's saying, come with me. Remember, this is why we have been encouraging everyone to memorize scripture, because this it is the what of the spirit, Dean. What is what is scripture? What what part of the armor of the spirit is that? Um, the shoes. No, it oh, is oh, the, sword. the sword. The sword of the spirit. Yeah. So, as we memorize God's word, the spirit uses an offensive weapon. He uses the sword, which is the word of God. That's why we intentionally are memorizing scripture. So, saint, salvation is. Being justified, being sanctified, and the last part of being the last part of salvation is being glorified. Guess what that is? That's when your body is made new in heaven. One day you're gonna go to a place where your body is no longer tempted by sin. There is no sin there. And your body will not have any disease, it will not have any illness, it will never die. You're gonna have a glorified body. That's coming. But as long as you're on this earth, a body without temptation, you're not going to have. You're going to have a body that has temptation. But what happens when a person is born again, God changes the heart, the will. The will changes. They may still be a real war, and the flesh will still be fighting. And there may be times when you don't yield to the Spirit. You give in to your flesh. But when you're a true Christian in your heart, that grieves you. You don't like that. You don't want to stay there. That's not who you are. You want to follow Jesus. Something happened inside you. I'll show you what happened. I want you guys to all turn there with me in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 16. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 16. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 16. Notice what it says. This is the covenant. By the way, the Bible sits split up into two sections. What are they called? Old Testament. Old Testament, New Testament. You know what the word testament? It's the same word for the word covenant. So you and I are new covenant people. This is the covenant. This is the New Testament that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. What will he do? I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Guys, when the Holy Spirit comes to you through faith in Jesus, you know what he does? He puts God's law on your heart. You want to obey God. Now again, your flesh still wants to do wrong, but your heart wants to follow God. And the Bible says, he adds in verse 17, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Verse 18, where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering of sin. You are completely forgiven. That's part of the new covenant. But guys, I have to go back now to Proverbs, and Proverbs is telling me tonight in chapter 10, verse 16, that how I spend my money indicates the true nature of my heart. When I, how do I, do, does, does the way I spend money reflect that I have a heart that's been made like God? Or, no. So you give me some extra money, and the first thing I'm thinking is, how can I go get high? How can I go... Uh, do something immoral. How can I go blow it? How can I go down to the casino? And by the way, you, wanna, you, know why, you know why gambling is sin? Because the Bible says that Christians are not to desire to be rich. That should not be a thing that motivates you. 
if, if you're doing that, the Bible says you're in danger. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Nothing wrong with being rich. God may bless you as you are faithful, and he may reward you and make you very wealthy. But the difference for a Christian is, as we saw a couple Wednesday nights ago, they do not set their heart on wealth. That's not what their heart is. Their confidence is not in that. That's not where their desires are. Their desires are towards God. As they're living their life, as they're honoring, God may bless them with wealth. Thank you, God, that you gave me wealth. If God doesn't give me wealth, thank you for giving me everything I need. We're fine. Okay? The problem with gambling is, what is what is the driving heart motivation behind it? Greed. This is not a Christian. This is a sinful heart. So someone gets a few bucks, they go down to the local convenience store and drop it down. There's lots of ways the way I spend money reflects the nature of my heart. I can be very selfish. Instead of, as the Bible teaches me, as we've seen already, we're going to learn a lot more in this in Proverbs about being generous. And last week we saw the one who considers the poor. What I tend to do when I get money is to be selfish with it or greedy with it or lustful with it or materialistic with it. For example, remember the story that Jesus tells in Luke when, when, when the two brothers come to him, they're fighting about the inheritance. And they say to Jesus, tell him to give me my part of the inheritance. And you know what Jesus says? Listen, I didn't come here to be a judge over your finances. And then Jesus says to them, he says to the one guy who said it to him, Take heed and beware that your life does not consist of covetousness. Because your life does not consist in the things that you possess. And then you know what he says to him? He says, I'm going to tell you a story about this rich man who had all this property. And he had so many goods, he decided, you know what? I'm going to build all brand new ones. And Jesus said to him about the man, he said, you're a fool. Tonight your soul is going to be required of you. Then who will all these things be? And the moral of the story, Jesus said, was... So is the man who is rich here, but is not rich toward God. A sinful heart, when they get money, consumes it on materialism. That's not how a Christian does. Instead, his heart is, as the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, if God makes him wealthy, he is generous, ready to share, and to lay up treasure for that which is really treasure in heaven. So guys, look at the way you spend your money. It reflects what means the most to you. It shows you what you desire the most. That's what Proverbs is saying. One of the great examples of this, we see how it really reflects the nature of a person's heart. Remember the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. All of a sudden, he goes to his father and demands to get his inheritance. He gets a huge windfall of money. And as soon as he's got a lot of money in his hands, what does the prodigal son do with all that money? The Bible says he wasted in reckless living. Luke chapter 15. He lived, the Bible says, in debauchery, sexual immorality, getting drunk. It's been a shame, and I've seen, again, some of these athletes, some of these guys that have blown millions and millions of dollars in casinos and fools. You see, what the Lord's concerned about is the condition, the real nature of your heart. And God is so good to us to let us see, okay, listen, don't trick yourself. How do you regularly speak? That's telling you the condition of your heart. You're not what you profess. You are what you say. You're not what you profess. You are how you spend. That's you. That's you. Don't trick yourself. The Bible says that the Lord does not see like man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance. The Lord looks on the heart. The Bible says in 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 9, the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. He knows the real heart motivation. And I'll tell you guys in my own life, you know, I, I, I believe God saved me as a boy. But as I was growing up, as I would think about sometimes some of these things, I would ask myself, okay, what do I tend to do if I got money or if I had time? 
And I would notice, boy, there, there are some sinful tendencies there. And the Lord's had to work and sanctify and say, wait a minute, I want to really notice what's the condition of my heart. So God's great in the fact that tonight, just like he often does, he takes his word and makes you look in the mirror and say, okay, what do you see? Look at this passage in the New Testament, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. Notice what it says. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. Galatians 6 verse 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. God's not going to be mocked. Whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. The wages of the righteous produce life. The income of the wicked produces sin. And all the consequences that come with it. By the way, in the context here, you know what it's talking about? Notice what it says in verse 6. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. This is talking about giving to support ministers. The Bible says don't be mocked. If, 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 if God gives you an income and you're not willing, your heart is not concerned about the, the advance of the gospel and the support to enable the minister to be focused on that task. So God's not going to be mocked. So guys, the bottom line tonight that Proverbs is teaching us is just like the way I speak indicates the true nature of my heart, the way I spend does. And let the Lord use the mirror of God's word to look at your heart and just ask yourself an honest question. Yeah, what would I do? Or what do I tend to do when I suddenly get a bunch of money that I did not have? Where do I do righteous things with it or sinful things with it? By the way, right, it is righteous when you come into income. What, what's righteous? It's righteous for a man to take care of his family. It's righteous to lay up for the future. That's a righteous thing to do. It is righteous to give first to God as a thank you for his providing for you. It is righteous to be generous. It is righteous to consider the poor. It is righteous to support the cause of the gospel. They're all righteous things. But it is unrighteous to use it to be lustful and materialistic and greedy and selfish. And you go on down the line. So we thank the Lord for scriptures like these that make me look at my heart, look at myself in the mirror, and then say, Lord, I come to you because in the new covenant, you put your law on my heart, on my mind. And I pray that you will change me there. And thank you for using the scripture tonight to do that, to see, to help me see that. Lord, thank you for your word. We ask that you will help us to take these matters to heart as you teach us each and every week. And we pray, Lord, that every part of our life, if you, if you looked at our checkbook, if you could be with us during our free time, if you're with us at work, if when we're by ourselves, when we're with our church family, that you would see the same person, a person who loves God and worships him there. Lord, we pray that you would unite our heart to fear your name. There would be no part of our life that lacks integrity. We ask these things in Jesus' name and by the power of the Spirit. Amen.